Thank you. This lecture is about the structure of the cat verb in the contemporary language, and it is also going to have some references to the historical development of the verb. The modern typology of the cat verb is very different than all of the surrounding languages, and yet I'll argue in this lecture that the surrounding languages have influenced the structure of the verb in an interesting way. If you look at a map of native Siberian languages before the, um, the coming of the Russians, the, the cat language uh, was spoken and still is in the northern central portion of Siberia. And most of the sister languages of Ket are now extinct, but because they were recorded with some degree of detail, it's possible to make a historical study of the development of the Ket verb by comparing Ket with its extinct sister languages. There are only about 50 speakers of Ket left, but they're still uh, possible to do research on the modern language. And there were many more uh, tribes of Yenisean speaking peoples, which is attested by the river names that are found throughout most of central southern Siberia. And when we look at the shape of the name of the word river in various languages, we see that there are several different uh, dialectal or different languages that are in the family. And you can see where the river names are located. When you compare the basic vocabulary and the sound correspondence in the vocabulary, but particularly the verb structure as well as we know it, there are four fairly distinct uh, branches. Uh, there's the caught branch, the pumpacol branch, for which very little verb information is extant, but the uh, lexical information shows it's a separate branch. And then finally, ket yuch. The fourth branch, aren, is possible to show that it's related to ket yuch at a fairly distant time depth by studying verb structure. I won't be getting into that in this lecture, but if that is accepted, there would be three primary branches of Yenisean that may go back 2,000 or more years because this, uh, the location of the uh, river names are in places that were uh, taken over by uh, pastoralists in the last uh, 2,000 years, and presumably the languages must have diverged before that period of time. If you look at a typical cat verb, you'll see that it has many, af many uh, morphemes in it. Most of the morphemes are prefixes, not suffixes. There's only one suffix, the anima, subject, plural, that you see on the end. Uh, the very first prefix is actually a, a, a clitic a ditropic clitic that can sometimes um, attach to the preceding word, and I'll mention why that might be the case in a later part of this lecture. The formal uh, structure of the ket verb, which is polysynthetic by any definition of the word polysynthetic, consists of eight prefix slots, uh, what we will call a base, which historically is the root of the verb, and the one suffix, the agreement with the sub anima plural subject. Um, you can see that you can divide any ket verb into these 10 prefix, these 10 positions, and you can give a number to each morpheme. And once you start studying the verb in this way, it's very possible to uh, become fluent in uh, being able to conjugate the verbs because there are only a limited number of ways that the verbs can, uh, can change grammatically. Okay. So uh, one of the features of cat that's uh, unusual for North Asia is that it has subject markers and object markers. It's polypersonal. And any, almost every cat verb is either transitive or intransitive, and you will be able to find a distinctly different subject as well as object marker in the transitive verbs. Okay. Um, there are really, despite the complexity of the verb, uh, structurally, there are really only two types of grammatical relations that are inside of the verb coded by these prefixes. And one of them is subject, object, agreement, in person, class, and number. And the other is tense mood. And the tense mood is past indicative, non-past indicative, that means either present or future, and imperative. So there aren't that many grammatical categories in cat, but the structure of it to express these categories is fairly complicated. There are limits in the complication, which I want to show before we get into more detail about how cat verbs are conjugated, how they're structured. You can't get longer than those 10 morpheme positions. It's, uh, unlike Eskimoan languages, you can't simply keep adding prefixes, can't uh, keep adding suffixes to the verb. There's no trivalent agreement. 
verbs are either in, uh, avalent, intransitive, or transitive. You don't have uh, um, three uh, um, subject, object, and indirect object markers in any verb. And there are strict limits on where nonverbal morphology can uh, go in the verb's uh, uh, um, template. Only in the prefix position seven can you actually put nonverbal morphology. Everything else is verbal morphology, including pronominals that appear only in verbs. And we cannot change verbs into other parts of speech and then change those parts of speech into verbs. It's not very easy to do that. We have a universal nominalizer in cat a s, and you can put that on any conjugated verb in the past or present indicative, and you wind up getting a uh, relative clause, essentially, a headless relative clause. But other than that, uh, verbs are verbs, and the other parts of speech are, are very different morphologically from the verbs. Now, functionally, there are three parts of any ket verb, and I'm using color in this presentation. The lexical morpheme shapes are going to be red. They're located in position seven, five, and then the base, but they're separated from one another in most verb forms by two types of grammatical affixes. The subject-object agreement markers in blue and the tense mood markers, which are always in two particular places, position four and two, prefix position four and two. And that's how the verbs are structured. That is uh, how all the cat verbs are structured. Here's another typical example using that color coding. The blue are the subject-object markers, and the red is the actual uh, um, lexical aspect of the verb, and the uh, s that you see here, that is showing that it's the non-past indicative. Okay. Lexical entry of a cat verb, how does it look? There are three portions of it. The lexical morphemes need to be listed. And the tense mood morphemes, although they're grammatical, are determined for each stem uh, it, which ones are used in positions four and two. So there are four main classes uh, that are productive in the language. So I'll get to those a little bit later. And then finally, where the subject and object markers uh, go, you have to list that as part of the lexical entry of the verb. You cannot predict it based on grammatical or semantic features. And so I'll show you what a cat verb entry would look like. Um, here they are in the bottom of the screen. The, the red are the lexical markers, but the, they are not a stem, a word-like uh, uh, construct. Instead, you also have to list where the subject or object marker is located in the template. You can't predict that. And you have to also list the tense mood class morpheme shapes, even though the expression of those shapes is grammatical. So a ket verb has what we could call a formulaic stem rather than a word-like stem. And that makes ket uh, also a polysynthetic language, closer to languages that we find in perhaps Africa or Native America, uh, and not uh, like the remaining languages of North Asia at all. Let's look at the first, the discontinuous lexical morphemes, the incorporate, the position seven, the, what we call thematic consonant, or they were called determiners, or determinative in some of the earlier literature, in position five, and finally the base. And even the base has some interesting features to discuss. Um, basically, position seven sometimes is used to incorporate a noun into the verb form. Remember, position seven is the only place that nonverbal morphemes can become part of a verb form. And so we can say, I make a snow sled, suldibet, using a subject and object marker, that's a transitive verb, but we can detransitivize it by removing the object marker and adding the actual object noun into position seven, and we'll come up with suldibet. And this is what is called uh, object uh, incorporation. There are a limited number of cat verbs that do this. Okay? There are only two cat verbs where you can incorporate the instrument. What is poked, what instrument you use to poke or hit with, or what is rubbed or smeared. Only the verbs hit and smear can incorporate the, uh, the uh, instrument. And they cannot incorporate the object, only the instrument. The, ob the object incorporating verbs cannot incorporate the instrument. You can't say, I knife make, meaning you make something with a knife. So incorporation with nouns 
is very constrained and lexicalized in the language. But it all occurs in position seven. Position seven also is allowing the incorporation of pre what we would call in another language predicate nominals. So in cat, you can have a, a word that means I became a shaman, and essentially you're saying I shaman became, and you have an incorporated verb. And, uh, so there are a few verbs that do, uh, do this, a few types of uh, verb bases that have, allow this type of incorporation. When we get to position five, we find that all of the determiners, the thematic consonants, are single consonants, they're morphemes, we don't often know what they mean. Sometimes you can make an argument by comparing lexicon to say that the meaning is a shape or a trajectory or a location. But the vast majority of these stems have determiners and you really are having a hard time to say what they mean. For instance, this uh, uh, stem means to see. It's, it's really not possible in, in modern language or even by comparing it to the extinct Yenisean languages to say what that t position five determiner means. It's simply part of the lexical entry of the verb. Many uh, verbs have a k that means passage of time. Perhaps that's the meaning of k, but we really can't say. So determiners often have to be uh, glossed as TC, thematic consonant. And they're very interesting for the historical study of the language. Okay. Uh, some determiners, if you compare the cat uh, word with a cognate in the Yuch language or in another extinct Yenisein language, you'll see that historically this T, position 5 T, actually came from two distinct morphemes that you can see in the other languages. So there's that that complicates um, the determiners. And then sometimes uh, the T, we don't have cognates, we really don't know where it came from, and we also don't know what it means. Here's a, there are rare stems that have three, up to three determiners that are associated with position five. And those sometimes have metathesis that moves one of the determiners forward. Uh, the le this lecture does not discuss it, we don't have time, but metathesis and also reanalysis of morphemes and morpheme positions is one of the most important ways that this type of templatic verb structure has changed throughout the, throughout the uh, millennia. Now, let's look a little bit closer at the grammatical aspects of the cat verb. Okay, the red is the lexical morpheme shapes. The tense mood markers are always in position four and two. Historically, position four was a kind of a conjugation marker. It's hard to know what that meant. Position two was a suffix on that marker that meant uh, completed versus non-completed action. Today, those meanings are not clear all of the time, and they simply have to be memorized, listed, as how the verb expresses past and present. Uh, so verbs will either have an, an, a se le or a se ne uh, in positions four and two. Some of them will have an a le or an a ne. The difference between se and a is impossible to determine based on what we know about the Yenisean languages. Historically, there may have been a reason for it. Okay, so the conjugations um, are uh, limited, but predicting them is only partly possible based on the meanings of positions four and two. Okay, uh, configuration of morpheme positions that express subject and object marking is the most complicated aspect of the entire cap verb. And basically, you have to memorize where the subject markers are going to go. You cannot predict it based on the meaning of the verb, based on the shape of the verb, so uh, what we find is there are three productive subject-object marking configurations, transitive configurations, and there are five productive intransitive configurations, and sometimes we have a few unproductive ones that have only one or two members. And finally, there are also avalent verbs where instead of saying rain falls, you say rains, and that's the entire verb. There's not any kind of an agreement in it at all. Okay? Here are just very quickly how the uh, system that I'm showing you here would deal with different subject-object marking configurations. There's a transitive configuration that I call number one, where the subject is in position eight, and the object in six. There's another subject in eight, object in position one. There's a third where we have the subject marked with multi-site agreement marking in position eight and six, and finally the object is in position uh, one again, and, and, uh, and so forth like that. 
So, and then there's one or two verbs where the subject is in position eight and one, and the object is in position six. There's historical reasons for all of this. When you compare ket with yuch and kot, you can see how the verb developed in this way. But it's quirky things like metathesis or sound changes, not real semantic reasons for the differences between these conjugations. Uh, here are some examples, example verbs. And very often you have almost this Syn synonymous verbs that belong to different conjugations because the reasons for the different conjugations are historical accidents caused by sound changes in metathesis and not by um, a, a meaning system like you have in a language that has semantic alignment. Ket is not a language that has semantic alignment. The five tra uh, intransitive configurations are the same way. You would have to study the history of the language to understand why a particular verb belongs to intransitive configuration one or four or five. And here are some examples of all of these. There are really idiosyncratic reasons for the membership in modern kept. So it has to be listed in the lexical entry of each verb. For instance, the, the word for dog is, uh, how, uh, I have a dog is one conjugation. I have a cat is another, and there's no uh, spiritual reason for that. There's no logical reason. It's just a his historical accident of how the language developed. And so uh, here are examples of the various uh, conjugations uh, of intransitive verbs. Okay. And you can see that sometimes you have near synonyms, like make a round trip to a river, uh, and it's going to belong to different conjugations. This is conjugation one here. This is conjugation uh, four here, and this is conjugation three. So you cannot predict uh, how the verbs will conjugate knowing the meaning. You have to actually know that this is part of the lexical entry of the verb. Now, let's finally get to the base, because the understanding the, what used to be the root position is going to let us make a generalization about how the surrounding languages have influenced the Yeniseian languages, specifically Ket. The base was the ancient root, and in all the basic vocabulary of Ket, you have the basic meaning of the verb expressed in the base, and then everything that's a prefix has grammatical or maybe opaque lexical meaning. But those are the on, only the basic uh, verbs in the language. Um, you also have some of those roots that allow uh, some, uh, some lexical material to be incorporated, um, uh, objects or instruments, maybe predicate nominals, for instance. And in fact, uh, in modern Ket, the only productive verbs that still have a recognizable lexical root in the P, uh, position zero, the base, are verbs that are incorporating verbs that incorporate nouns or maybe adjectives. Um, here are examples of some of those verbs. And uh, uh, there are vast majority of verbs in the language uh, do not have a base that has a recognizable lexical meaning, all right? And so reason for that is because uh, the, the verb has been influenced by the surrounding languages so that, the, so that uh, there's a, 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 a need to put a recognizable lexical meaning in the beginning of the verb, in position seven, okay? So uh, this could be a noun incorporate, but also you can incorporate some verbal elements there. Uh, and as a result of that, the, the position eight prefix, which is the subject position, has stopped becoming part of the uh, regular phonological verb. Instead, it's become a clitic that will attach to the preceding word. So often it isn't even there. Um, and it's the incorporate that is the beginning of most ket verbs. And I call this the uh, aerial influence of the surrounding languages that caused the suffixization of the template. We keep all the morpheme positions in the template. We keep all the morphemes in the template. But we're incorporating a verb root into the position seven so that it is at the beginning of the verb and everything else looks like a suffix, similar to all of the surrounding languages. Okay. And so the bases are, in most verbs, no longer recognizable as, um, as lexical roots. They almost act like suffixes of uh, transitivity or of, um, of other um, uh, grammatical features. <clears throat> and this is because uh, the cat verb has a, a nominal form called the infinitive or action nominal, you could call it. Um, and verbs have started uh, to be made by incorporating that into this position 
position eight has stopped being part of the grammatic, uh, the, the phonological verb, so that the verb root is at the beginning of m almost all productive ket verb uh, formations. And what used to be the root in, here in the base has become a marker of transitivity, of iterativity, and so everything after the incorporate in these action nominal incorporating verbs looks like a suffix. And so the verbs in ket look a lot more like the verbs in the surrounding Uralic, Turkic, Mongolic languages. Here's some examples of that. INF means infinitive or action nominal. And so a subject repeatedly makes uh, whatever is expressed in infinitive uh, or makes it once. Uh, repetition or one time is expressed by changes in the base, almost like the base has become a suffix. And in fact, uh, in terms of function, it certainly has. So there are about, 30, so about 33 productive models of cat verb formation. Most of them are these infinitive incorporating verbs that are de facto suffixing verbs. These are just some examples that you can see here. Okay. And so uh, you could go through and look at every productive model, but every productive model has a recognizable root, either nominal or verbal, at the very beginning of the phonological verb. Okay, and here's some more examples of this. Okay. <clears throat> and so what we can do to, to summarize here is to look at all the different structural types of verbs in the NSA in, in cat language. They all behave according to that 10-slot template. The, Less than 10% of the verbs are having the root at the very end. This is the ancient type of verbs construction. And they do not have a, le a recognizable lexical form at the beginning of the verb. That's less than 10% of all the verbs in the language, but it's almost all of the core vocabulary, sort of like strong verbs in Germanic languages. Then we have another 20, 25% of the verbs in the language that belong to a handful of highly productive nominal incorporating patterns where we still have a recognizable verb root in the base, but we do have a nominal form that is recognizable lexical meaning at the beginning of the verb. And so again, it is not that different than the verbs that are in the surrounding languages in the sense that you have a lexical element and then a lot of other elements that follow it. But more than <coughs> maybe 65, 70% of the verbs in the language are verbs where we've used the incorporation position to actually put verbal morphology in the form of an action, a nominal. And the uh, base of these verbs has kind of eroded down semantically as well as uh, phonologically into a marker of transitivity and, iter or, and or iterativity. <coughs> and most cat verbs that are made are in this fashion. And these are very much like suffixing verbs. And to conclude, you can look at the 10 slot template that has survived over 2,000 years, almost all of these slots, all but one are in the cot language. And so we can say that this is very, very conservative. We have metathesis and reanalysis of some of these positions when we compare the different NSA languages. But only a few of the verbs are actually prefixing like the original, even though all the morphing positions have been preserved. Most of them are de facto suffixing verbs where the semantic peak of the verb is expressed in P7, and also P8 has become a, 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 an enclitic on the preceding word. And so Ket has preserved the unique features of its typology in terms of its verb structure over at least 2,000 years. And yet, it's been influenced by the surrounding languages because it has changed the way it uses that structure so that the verbs appear to be suffixing rather than prefixing. And so it's an interesting combination of ancient and modern features using the, uh, the, the same template. Thank you for your attention. And I am very grateful that you allowed me to give this presentation uh, from not being able to attend the conference. Thank you very much.